Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're well. This is Saik, and I'm back with another GoLine tutorial today. I know I've been away for a couple of months. I'm kind of busy over the summer, just getting away from the PC and doing other stuff. But um, I'm giving viewers to get back into Jim Dinks and GoLang, and I wanted to share something with you today. And before we get started with the video today, I just wanted to mention that I have rebranded the channel a little bit. So I'm trying to make it a little bit more personalized. So I'm changing my channel name. It's not going to be Sigfold or Sigfolds going forward. Then Sigfold was taken, uh, which I thought was a bit of a, a name, an old name pun on, on the Sigfold that happened when I write. And I started writing code. And really it's just about the journey that I'm on and the mistakes that I'm making. So I figured uh, Sigfolds would be an, an appropriate name. So you might see the channel channel change. Um, and the other thing that's changed is that there's been a new Go release while I was away. Well, she's a little bit older, but I haven't looked at it since I was away. Uh, so now we have Go 123, right? And in 123, they introduced a bunch of different stuff. But one of the things they introduced at the top here is iterators. So I figured we could take a little bit of an introduction to iterators today in Go, see how we can use them, see what they are, and uh, explain or talk a little bit about what I think I might be using them for and, and if I think Go be useful um, as, a, as a Go developer. So... Let's dive right in because I, I like to learn by example. So let's bring out and new them and get started. So what we have here is a really simple little program. We have a slice of integers and we go through them and print them out. We've done this a million times. This is really nothing special. So if we go ahead and run this, we should see, welcome to great iterators and then printing out the numbers zero to six. Great. Before we uh, get started, make sure you are actually using um, Go 123 or above. So I'm, you can run Go version in your terminal. So I'm running Go 123. Uh, so we're able to use this new iterator functionality. So what are iterators in Go? Well, you see this kind of nice syntactic shiver for going through this range of slices using the range keyword. That's essentially using iterators on the hood. And by default in Go, we have iterators for things like slices, maps, and channels. We've looked at all those things in, in on this channel. And we use them a lot for slices and map slide. It's like our primary way of looping through uh, collections like slices and maps. But with iterators, you can actually define your own implementation that the range keyboard or keyword can use. So let's give this a, a shot. And we'll start with like the most simple way. So the way it works, right, is you can actually define a function in, say, my iterator. And this function takes a anomalous function, which is a so-called yield function, which is basically describing the behavior of your iterator. So what would this look like? Well, in this case, let's make a really, really simple run, right? So this one is really simple. We can just say another for loop in here and we'll just count up to three, for example. And then we'll say, if not yield, because remember yield takes a Boolean, then we return. Okay, so let's just walk through this. What, what have we done here? So we've created a function, my iterator, which takes as a parameter a yield functional um, parameter. This, in turn, is a function that takes an integer and returns a bool. And we just go from zero to three inside this iterator. And we check if the yield function returns true or false, which is our sort of our predicate for continuing to loop or not, or continuing to iterate or not. And if it doesn't, if it's false, then we return. Okay? So, great. What can we do with this? Well, let's start with the most simple example. We can, not that, excuse me. We can do this. Now, you might say, this is pretty useless to me. I'm already able to range through it. Uh, integers like this, this doesn't introduce anything new. And you're absolutely right. This is a, a trivial example to show you a bit of how the insides of these iterators work. So the way that they work are these yield functions that you pass in that take parameters and then return a true or false. And you come out, you can go through and your collection that you're iterating on, I mean, you can decide if you're going to yield the number or not, return the number or not, or you didn't have to say true or false, right? So let's just do a bit more of an interesting example then. So one of the big things with iterators now in Go 123 is you can use it for custom types. And I think this is where you'll see the most use of it. Basically, personally, I think you won't actually be writing a lot of iterators in your everyday life as a Go developer. But what you'll probably find is that a lot of libraries that you use, a lot of um, third-party things that you use will have custom structs, for example, or custom types that are now suddenly using iterators. And you did a much nicer syntax for ranging through or iterating through things. So let's take a look at how that could work. So let's say, for example, I'm going to introduce a type. I'm going to say my cool numbers. What is to do a type alias here? So 
as an example. So we're still going to use int just to make it a bit easier to reason, but we're now wrapping it inside this our own little type, right? So we've got my cool numbers, which is our, our type. So let's introduce a iterator that actually works on my cool numbers. So we can do that by trading a number function like we've done before. And let's say out of all my cool numbers, I only want the even ones. So this will be a bit interesting. So we're going to write this custom iterator. So we're going to write the yield function. Our yield function now is going to take an integer again. We're going to name it this time. We're going to name parameter on the yield function. And it's going to return the pool like it did before. Then we're going to actually return this result of the yield function like so. And bear with me here. There's quite a lot of syntax that we're going through. But I'll explain it all as we go through it. And now we are basically... So we're returning an iterator function within this function. And now we're inside the body of our iterator function and we can introduce our functionality. So the easiest way we can do this, right, is to say, let's just go through my cool numbers. And then we're going to check if the number is even. How do we do that? Well, we use the modulus or modulus operator. This is a mathematical operator that you may be familiar with. Basically, um, there's a whole mathematical reason why this is true but if the modulo operator um, using the number two has a rest value of zero it's basically the result is zero um, then it's an even number i'll leave it up to you to find out the mathematical proof for that you can look at some Euler's algorithm if you're interested and now we're back down inside um inside the shim and I'd already messed up some of the syntax here. This is one of the things that you'll learn in writing these iterators is that there's definitely a lot of syntax that you have to go through. So let's see why it's unhappy here. So it says unreachable code. Um, if it's mine, yields. And we're yielding this one. And then we're going for this one. Going for that one, going for that one. <clears throat> Let's see why oh, it's so unhappy. Unkeeled, fooled, unkeeled. All right. There we go. So the problem here was again, there's a lot of syntax here. We will. We will trim this down, but I'm trying to be very explicit here to basically teach you um, about how this, how the inside of these iterators work. So the problem there was that I wasn't using the proper anonymous function declaration for the, for the yield function. And so it thought it was calling yield directly and then it would just never get out of this loop. So what we've done now here is we've created a iterator that takes or that is called on, on top of our custom type and it's called evens since we're returning even numbers and it basically iterates through all these numbers using our youth function syntax that we use up here. And then we are checking if the number is even or not when we come across a number and if it is, then we yield the number and if it's not, then we return. Right? So we don't, we don't yield the number if it's not true. So let's try this out. So we'll go and we'll actually ch change this low thing to now instead be my cool numbers. And we can go ahead and instantiate that. Like so. And now what we can do is we can do this. So this is where I think it really starts becoming interesting is now you have this really custom declarative way of saying, making this really readable code down here. So even though this up here is not very readable at all, Think of it as this way. This will likely be inside your library or won't really be, let's say, customer facing or won't really be facing the doubters that use your code. But once you have it, people can write stuff like this. Like, I have a lot of cool numbers. I want to go for the Eden numbers. So let's try and see if we've actually made a mistake or if this actually works. And there we go. So we ran it and it now has 0246. Cool, it ran. So again, this stuff is really very, very hard to read. And for that reason, the Go um, developers, when they released 123, actually made some of this stuff a, bit, a little bit easier. So this whole declaration of funk yield, funk, and then some kind of type is actually been 
abstracted away inside a new type in the iter or iterator library that ships at Go. So if we import the iterator library, they have a type called seek, um, and there's seek or seek too. And you can actually do this, and, and notice that I just replaced this like so, and those two are actually equivalent. So this is what you'll most likely see when you start seeing some implementations of iterators, is you'll actually see, let's see if we do it down here as well. Uh, let's see. We'll leave it down there. But if you actually see implementation of iterators, you'll see something like this, more likely, which is basically saying this is a sequence of integers iterator that you can use on any sequence of integers. In this case, we're doing it on micro numbers because we're showing the fact that we're using it on custom types. But if we run this again, you'll see that we'd still get the same result. Now, you saw that there is more than one seek. There's seek and there's seek two, right? So this actually relates to the fact, if we pull this in, that um, we saw in the, in the opening session of this video that they have multiple iterators. So there's things like func k bool and there is func k v bool, so key value. And if you remember, normal range things can actually go over maps as well. Right, so it can go over key value objects and the same is true for iterators. So if you wanted, if you have more than just one dimension in your, in your collections, if you had like the keys and values, for example, with a map, then you could use seek2 rather than seek. Now, the last thing I want to show you with iterators, before we talk a little bit about what I think of them in general, is that one thing that's cool about having custom types is that when you have custom types, you can also use generics, right? So let's see if we can change this a little bit to actually be more of a generic iterator, because now we've said, okay, evens is an iterator on my core numbers. Great. What if you wanted to be an iterator on any kind of number? Let's try it out. So if you are familiar with Go generics, this will be trivial for you. But if you're not, I'll just give you a little bit of, of background. But essentially what you can do in Go is you can specify some constraints on a type. And we'll talk about that in a second. And you can actually say that this function will work for anything of that type. So now I changed a little bit here and it's already throwing a bunch of errors and we'll fix those in a second. So what I'm saying here is that there's going to be a function Eden's. It's going to be, it's going to be working for a, a collection of, um, of a type E when it's called the type E, that's sort of the, um, standard called type E. You could also call it, it doesn't really matter. You call it N right for number like so and like so. And then it's saying, well, your number is, is undefined. What, what the hell is a number? Well, what you need to do is essentially tell it what a number is. So we can say a number is an interface. And then we can say of, and there's a constraints library in Go you can use and say number is, for example, an integer. Okay. And it could be more than integer. It could be, if we pull in. It could also be, so there's loads of constraints that you can say that you live up to. You could say it could be an unsigned integer, right, for example. Uh, but let's just give it a range here. Now we're using as an example. So now we're saying Eden's is now a general function. It's no longer meant the function of micro members. And we've now got a u function that still says int. So we'll change that to say n for number. Now we're ranging through something here, but we've actually changed the parameter to be e. So we'll change that there. And then finally down here, we do the same, like so. So what have we done here? We've actually generalized our iterator, the evens iterator, to work for any number, not just micro numbers, but any numbers, as long as the constraints of the number interface have or are um, satisfied. Now, this gets a bit interesting, right? Because we, we haven't actually, for example, this wouldn't work, right? Um, well, if we, we can try it out, but let's see. I don't think this will work, but... You could add additional constraints. So how do we actually call it now? Well, it's easier now. We call it like so. So now it's, it takes an, uh, a collection that lives up to this thing. And there we go. So now we have Michael numbers, which is, we're still um, defining here. And we're just calling for range evens x. So let's try running less than zero atoms. And boom, it still works. And we now have the constraint up here saying constraint float, right? So we, it even works for floats. 
Now, I don't think this will actually work for floats, but we can try that. We can say S is my cooler numbers, and then we can put some floats in there. So let's try this out. 2.2, 3.1, 4.1. And I think what will happen is it can compile, but we've written some ridiculous things here. So let's go and remove this. And if we run this now, okay, so it ran and it's returning some numbers. But what's actually happening already to you, the more e delighted you might see this, is that it's actually rounding the float into integers and then saying it's even a mod. And that makes sense because our iterator body function, if we remember up here, is actually doing that, right? It's basically treating it as an integer here because we're checking if the modulo is um, equal to zero like so, and then we're using it as an index as well. So it's it's going to have to treat it as, as, a, as an integer. And as a result, we get these numbers. But it, it shows an interesting... Um, behavior in iterators, which is why I introduced it, which is that the youth function is pretty flexible, right? So even though we're doing stuff under the hood that's changing the way we use the number, we're changing it, we're using the float as an integer inside the youth function, we're still yielding the float that came back. So this is something that you can use when you're working up other types, is saying, okay, uh, you can use stuff in the youth function and still return the original number when the youth function returns true, because all the iterator cares about is that this thing returns true or false, right? So that's why it's it's kind of interesting here is is essentially we we've overloaded the iterator a little bit to give us some interesting behavior around the yield function and how it works. So before we leave you I'll talk a little bit about why I think this is interesting and why I think you could be coming across this more often. I think iterators in Go are in a strange place in the first place so they were prior to 123 and basically there were iterators already. If you work with things like the database library, the Postgres library, MySQL library, you would have used things like database rows and their iterators. And it was always a bit clunky and there was no standardized way of doing it. I think with the introduction of these iterators in 123, especially like the iterator seek um, syntax here, I think you'll be seeing these things implemented a lot because writing's code like this can actually be really declarative and really sort of easy to follow. You know, you're now saying, okay, I'm going to range through something and this is a custom iterator. And often you'll see them use as filters. I think you'll see things like we could have implemented one from my cool numbers. That's like, give me all the prime numbers inside my cool numbers, for example. And then we could have said for ranging in cool numbers are primes, for example, and then we get all the prime numbers. And I think things like that will be make it really easy to use um, work with these custom types at a higher level. So what I'm thinking is that you won't see a lot of implementations like this because they'll be hidden away in libraries that you're using or you'll be writing them yourself for your own library. But you will see a lot of things like this where you're actually using custom iterators to iterate through data types, which is why I think they added them in the first place. Other than that, I think one of the benefits will be for things like streaming. For example, one thing, one problem that Go had with the existing iterators is that you basically had to load the whole data structure into memory before you could go food, like what you're using a map or a slice, even if you're using pointers under the hood, it'll load the whole thing as whereas of custom iterators, you have really big control over the yield function and how it works, as we've seen here, we've kind of overloaded it to do silly things, but we, we actually have really good control over it. And I think that's something that a lot of people will be able to use to make really powerful custom iterators. So I hope this was a nice little introduction to iterators in Go 123. And let me know in the comments if you actually use these or what you think of them. And I'll see you in the next one.